I hope you are doing well. All praise be to the creator. We are back once again. This is Amuna. Woo. That's all I got to say, y'all. It's been a wild day, but I'm giving thanks and praise for another opportunity to have a discussion. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, Yeah, you might be like, dang, Amuna, another one? Yes, another one, another one, another one, another one. Why? This is, let me just say at the beginning, the top disclaimer, this is not, um, I'm not really uh, political. This the reason I'm doing this or sharing is not for political reasons. And it's funny to show you how you may be on to something in discussion. Before I even started, I got one thumbs up, one thumbs down, and I didn't say anything yet. <laughs> it just has the title, Echoes of Africa, Forced Migration from the Caribbean to New York. ADOS homework. This is what I named this. Um, like I was saying, this for me is not political. There's many people that are on it for different reasons. Again, the reason why I'm addressing or speaking to certain things, uh, it's in it's in conjunction with the Left Project, which is what I've been doing for the last three years. Um, online is the Left Project, and it's in conjunction with getting an uh, accurate uh, depiction of the history that has been left on record as opposed to the reimagined history that we tend to um, believe and sell one another. And then we base our reality now on this reimagined history. And the reason why uh, for this, uh, I guess it, the, the left project flame within me has been rekindled is because I heard some of the very same things that made me want to start the left project to begin with which is some things that are inaccurate, some things that we didn't know, some things that we possibly forgot, some things that it would be better if we reimagined it. And I'm like, that's not, if we're going to be honest, like I said before, then we have to be honest. Okay. So for those who just joined us, the name of this one is Echoes of Africa, Forced Migration from the Caribbean to New York. Again, I am still addressing, sorry, this is the third video addressing. Sometimes, A, we have to take it bit by bit. There's a there's a proverb the proverb how do you eat an elephant even though you know elephants are unclean but the proverb is how do you eat the elephant and it's bit by bit so um sometimes when I'm looking at something that's errant whatever it's in myself whatever it's in the culture whatever it's in the healing process I will stay a bit of time on the topic right because we, we sometimes we'll be like oh yeah see this is it and you keep moving so I showed um in the first preliminary this is all preliminary like i said this is just not even any long long extensive arduous searching these are really just preliminary studies on some of the things that are said and some of the things are just right below the surface that if we cared to know we could find out so i'm gonna take you once again on the journey i took you already to miami coconut grove um again we're looking at the statement that um that uh, Caribbean people who were dropped off, people who were dropped off in the Caribbean, did not sweat, did not fight, did not bleed, and bones were not buried on mainland America. Okay, that's the statement that we're looking at. And we're looking to see whether or not that statement is rooted in history or that is a revisionist form of history, okay? And that statement came from, and, it, and it's repeated many times, from one of the founders of the ADOS movement. So I know that their focus is political, and I understand that, and their focus may very well be on um, the bag, you know what I'm saying, reparations, and I understand that. All I'm saying is that this is why the study to, the, the proposal to study reparations, like I said, that we will come, come back to, deals with a team of people. It deals with a team of people from all different aspects who have expertise in all different spaces, so that when you collaborate, your story is airtight, because if in just a short period of time, this last week, I can listen to a statement and be like, well, hold up, I'm not no all the way 50 year expert, but I can do a little tippy tappy and to find out that the story is not airtight. So that makes the, that makes the, um, it, it essentially, if you do want to achieve reparations, when you make statements that are not founded in history, it kind of weakens the case. So this is why I call this homework because I have had an overflow of those who are in support. And like I said, I'm not trying to jump in and tell people what to do um, in respect to what they're going for for themselves. However, you know, again, like I said, accurate retelling of history based on information that was left on record. So the first thing I addressed was the um, Color of Wealth article that came out in Miami and the slanted article. If you missed that, you can go ahead and check it out. 
what's behind the numbers. The next thing I addressed, I believe it was yesterday. Was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. Um, I addressed uh, the conversation or the comment I made concerning South Carolina. Hopefully I gave you sufficient amount of uh, evidence or information to at least for you to start your own journey and looking at who came to South Carolina. And today I have a treat for you. Today, I'm going to look at the forced migration from the Caribbean to New York. Of those, because when I asked the question of what was a quote real African American, um, you know, I know the brother probably thought I was being facetious, but that's a real question to ask. What is the criteria that you're using to say who is a real African American, quote unquote, and who is a real Caribbean? And what is the starting point? Did it start in the 1600s? Did it start in the 1700s? How long, you know, do you did you lose the fact that you were in the Caribbean and now that you're in America? You know what I'm saying? It's a little bit hazy. And when I'm asking questions, it's only for clarity. You know what I'm saying? But anywho, I'm gonna give you my screen now, and we're gonna look at this. Hopefully, you're taking the no oats. Hold on, let me. I'm gonna share my screen. How's everybody doing today? All right, cool. This is this is how preliminary this study is, okay? And I'm gonna show y'all how I'm doing it so that you can, you know, educate yourself. Before I, I came on just now, I was watching a video and the comment section under that video was wild, but it was some Ghanaians who were addressing the issue on their estimation between African and African and African American. Okay, and I'm sitting there listening and they had some interesting points to note. One of them is what is uh, the misinformation or lack of information concerning what actually happened. Because it's a, it's a wound, it's a trauma, it's collective. Everybody has their perspective. One person felt robbed, the other person felt abandoned, the other person felt uh, dismissed. So when you come to this space that is still festering, that is still infected, that still has pus in it, that has not been processed, and injustices are still happening, it's difficult to look at the facts because the feelings are still there. This is why I'm a big proponent of cleansing emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually, right? This is why I, when I came to this from my walk of life, I realized it could not be done purely intellectually. But that's another story for another day. Um, on the screen right now, this is preliminary. Everybody has access to Wikipedia, okay? So you look at a statement of interest. A lot of times certain statements are gonna pass us, like I said, if we're emotionally invested in a narrative because we're drawn to it for whatever reason, then the chances are we're going to overlook certain things because it supports the, the stance that we desire to take. Coming to this conversation, I would say that I've done my, some own personal processing myself. So I personally don't necessarily have that baggage that I need to buy into a narrative um, for whatever reason, because I'm talking about individually certain things and certain work I have done some publicly, a lot privately. And, you know, so I'm, I'm listening actively without necessarily being triggered. I know the concern was, you know, Muna, your people's, you know, uh, Carib American. So you may be triggered in that way. I would say it, it made it of interest. But again, like I said, I've been studying this, a lot of things that didn't necessarily come directly connect to um, my parents or where my parents came from. And I, I, that proof is here, so I really don't have to explain all that. Anywho, um, West Indian Americans, okay? Um, it's an article on Wikipedia, and it tells you that they can trace their ancestry to the Caribbean unless they are of native descent. As of 2016, about 3 million people residing in the United States or 0.93 of the U.S. population have West Indian ancestry. The question is, what are they using to, to determine that? But anywho, it, uh, the second says, the Caribbean is the source of the United States' earliest and largest black, so-called black immigrant group and the primary source of growth of the population in the US. So I'm gonna continue. The region has exported more of its people than any other region of the world since the abolition of slavery in 1834. The lar with the largest Caribbean immigrants, Sources to the U.S. are Cuba, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and Haiti. U.S. citizen migrants migrants also come from Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. As we know, those are U.S. territories, okay? So when you read the beginning of that, say, see, there's a lot of them here, and that's what's going on. But that's not what is interesting to me. What is interesting to me is the 
history, okay? Because we're looking at the claim that no blood, sweat, tears, no bodies are buried here, and you know, and and that's not the case. Okay, we saw in the last two episodes of this homework edition that that's not the case, and we're about to see in this episode that that's not the case. Okay, here's a little clue. Anytime I see clues, I think I shared this before. Anytime I see clues, see Wikipedia is a resource. Some people take Wikipedia as the be all end all. Wikipedia is not the be all end all. Wikipedia is the clue. It's the overview. It's the it's the nowadays version of Encyclopedia Britannica. Back in the day, like what we had when we were children doing book reports. Okay, the history of African Caribbean immigration in the United States can be traced back to slavery when the British colonies in the Americas shifted enslaved Africans to different territories as the demands of capital and plantation economy dictated. So boom, right away, even on Wikipedia, I'm sorry, even, hey, Shalom was tough guy. Even on Wikipedia, we have evidence, or at least we have a clue that many of the bodies, like we showed in South Carolina, were coming were priorly enslaved in the Caribbean because slavery started first in the Caribbean and South America before America. It's not a slight to say America got the least amount of slaves. It's a historical fact. But like I said, if we have other things blocking that, we would take it as a slight or someone would take it as a slight instead of saying, you know what, let me see if that has any historical veracity, okay? First Africans from the West Indies who arrived in the United States were slaves brought to South Carolina in the 17th century. We read about that yesterday. These slaves, many of whom were born in Africa, number among the first people of African origin imported in the British colonies of North America. So they took them from the continent and then they took them to the uh, islands and they enslaved them in the islands. Then they took them from the islands and brought them to America. So would that have made them Caribbean if they were enslaved in the Caribbean? Because one of the arguments is that you had to be enslaved in the place and wherever you were enslaved that that should be the place where you should go looking for the bag. And so the question now is, as we're reading, if you're enslaved in both places, how does one disqualify one and say that people from this area did not contribute to the building of this country when it's on record that they did? Okay. Over time, Barbadian slaves will make up a significant part of, listen to this. Remember, we have Jamaican and was it Antiguan? Yeah, Barbados and Suriname yesterday in South Carolina. Listen to this. Over time, Barbadian slaves would make up a significant part of black population in Virginia, mainly in Virginia Tidewater region of Chesapeake Bay. The number of enslaved Africans bought from the Caribbean increased in the 18th century as the 13 colonies, the future continental US, broaden its trade relations with other Caribbean islands. The very foundation of slavery in this country were stocked with melanated people from the continent who were enslaved in both places. I wanna keep stressing that, but I'm gonna continue because I have a treat for you. We're not just gonna read Wikipedia all day, but this is just the beginning, okay? It says, <clears throat> Uh, the number of enslaved Africans imported from Caribbean decreased after the New York slave revolt of 1712. Any time is highlighted and you want to learn more, just go ahead and click on it. But we're not going to do that just yet. We're going to keep going. As many white colonists, so-called white, blame the incident on slaves recently arrived from the Caribbean. Remember, my thing is, where is the point of contention? As somebody who talks about healing, deals with trauma, where is the point of contention? Where is the point of disconnect? Where can we identify in our history that we could have seen what we're experiencing now and we don't know what the source of it is? So when I saw this, I'm like, okay, note to self, stick a pin, okay? Nevertheless, between 1715 and 1741, most of the slaves of the colony remained from the West Antilles. From 1715, remember yesterday we read about South Carolina, how from 1670 to 1690, it was straight imports or reassignments. You know, you got reassigned from one prison to the next, okay? Reassigned from the Caribbean to the mainland, 
we read about that. Remember, each colony, like I said, was its own little thing. So in South Carolina from 16, 1670 to 1690, it was straight imports from the Caribbean island. But as we read yesterday, it didn't just totally stop. So this article is saying that after the slave revolt, so we're gonna go to New York now and see what's happening with the slave revolt, okay? It says that at, even after that point from 1715 to 1741, most, remember from 1741 to 1865 is only 120 years. So most of the slaves of the colonies remain from West Antilles all the way up until this time. All the way up until this time, the majority of the emelinated bodies who were stocking, bleeding, bleeding, fighting, dying, birthing on this side of the, the, the mainland came from the Caribbean. I, I told y'all, don't, don't feel no way. Left Project information kind of get me, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I, you know, bringing bringing forth this is not the aha moment. This is a moment for us to educate ourselves so that when we, because the people we talking to know a lot of this history. If we're going into certain spaces trying to talk to certain people, we have to have our history down pat. It can't be like yeah, them over there and these over down yonder. We have to know migration patterns. We have to know turning points. We have to know laws. We have to know all the things that happened to get us to this point. Wherever you are, whether you be in the Caribbean, whether you be in the mainland, whether you be in South America, this stuff is important. So I'll continue. However, after the New York slave revolt of 1741, slaves imported from the Caribbean were severely curtailed and most enslaved Africans were brought directly from Africa. So it takes all the way up to 1741 for this type to change. You know what that also means? That also means there was a large body of melanated people who came from the Caribbean. And now you have a different set of melanated people coming straight from the continent. You have in two people, not only that, you have people who are representing different tribes, number one. Then you have people who are running like, you know, what said you repping from? This person was in this jail, and now this person just came just from the continent. So you have a lot of emotional baggage and trauma that meets at this place. Okay? So we're gonna stick a pin right here. So we already just saw just from the Wikipedia article alone. If we want to say Virginia is 1619 and we want to say South Carolina is late 1600s, okay, we're talking about at least 100 years of being stocked from the Caribbean. At least 100 years of being stocked from the Caribbean. We're going to continue. Now I'm going to take you over here. The name of this book here, I'm going to come to the comment section in a minute. I'm going to come to this comment section. Let me, let me reiterate. All that I'm doing right now, because I know sometimes when we have something on our mind, we want like answers, answers, answers. The only thing that I am doing right now is not just convincing anybody. I'm providing the historical context to disprove the statement that a lot of this is based on, which is we need to separate. And, and, and if that's what you want to do, do that. So what I'm disproving is not the whether or not you feel you need to separate. What I'm disproving is the thought, the thought that is being said that Caribbean, those who are enslaved, because that's what we're talking about. They, they're not from the Caribbean. In the same way, the, those who are here are not from here. We know that everyone was taken from somewhere else. But there's this thought once we got to this side of the water that those who were enslaved in the Caribbean in some way must have been like, you know what I'm saying, stuck in, in on the Caribbean islands and never contributed to anything here. And so now it's thievery and robbery and all of these things because now you want to come from the Caribbean and take what we have worked for. And that statement is the statement that I'm taking to task. Whether or not bodies who were enslaved in the Caribbean did come here, did bleed here, did fight here, did contribute. And so far, just on Wikipedia alone, we are seeing the answer is yes. But we're going to continue. The river flows on. If you want this book, it's on Amazon. <clears throat> if you want a little bit of the free information, like I said, this is preliminary. I'm going to actually, I, I got a lot of information from preliminary. And then when I think it's valuable, I buy the book, right? So the name of this book right here is The River Flows On. <clears throat> The river flows on. 
Black resistance, culture, and identity formation in early America. I'll say this again. If we're going to base, we have to promise pro process our pain and trauma. If we do not, we will be vulnerable to any narrative that someone wants to feed us. So if we are, if we are at whatever side of this argument you fall on, if you're interested in reparations, if you're interested in reparations from the Caribbean or you're interested in reparations from America, wherever you are, be vested as much as you are in the reparations in the history. Because the history is what's going to bring some level of understanding. It's going to bring some level of healing, some level of ability to process what it is that we're experiencing and understand what you're experiencing based on what has come before. So Black Resistance, Culture, and information, Identity Formation in Early America by Walter C. Rucker. <coughs> as you can see, I put the link in the box so you can follow along if you want. The name of this book is The River Flows On. Okay. Now the book is the book. The part that I want to get to, I'm just going to preface, okay? The con this is um, the contents, Echoes of Africa. I got that from chapter one. And we're going to look in chapter one from Echoes of Africa, okay? Now, this is talking about New York. And we know at first New York was controlled by the, by the who? Who was New York controlled by at first? Uh, who is the, who's New York controlled by at first? Okay, so for the Dutch at first, because remember, you have Spanish, you have the French, you have the Dutch, you have the English, you have Portuguese, right? Portuguese was earlier on in the slave trade. And then later on, you have the Spanish, and then you have the Dutch who got in there, and then you have the French who got in there, and lastly, English got in there, okay? <clears throat> so I'm going to jump down here. Jump down. I want to get to something again that's substantiating why I'm pushing back on this thought because it's not true. All right. <clears throat> Y'all gonna again the link is in the box, so feel free to you know. I looked up the book on Amazon, you can get a used one relatively cheap. So definitely, if you're interested in it, invest in the book so you can read all of this. The introduction and why, <clears throat> why um, for my personal research, I'm definitely going to buy the book. For the purposes of this preliminary study, I'm going to take you straight to the point that I'm trying to get to. <clears throat> this is all the introduction, y'all. It's talking about rebellion, right? Because there's a lot of thoughts that, you know, people didn't fight back and who was fighting back and who was the slave Negro, the field Negro, all of that stuff, right? So we're going here because of what was said in the Wikipedia article. It's giving us a synopsis of all the chapters. That's what's taking us so long here. I think I'm trying to get to page. Okay, fires of discontent echoes of Africa, the 1712 New York City revolt. Okay, so this is the this is chapter one. Again, definitely read it at your own discretion. Again, it's gonna go through the Dutch when it changes hands from the Dutch to the English. So the beginning part of this is talking about 1619. <clears throat> it's talking about the Dutch. It's talking about how many Africans were on board. Okay. And then it, it talks about Jamestown, Virginia. And, it talk, and so then definitely read that. <clears throat> and then it goes on to talk about the, quote, failure of the Dutch colony and how it switches hands into the English. <clears throat> See, even in 1627, a total of 14 Africans had arrived in Dutch New Netherlands, but this initially slow trickle became a torrent over the course of the next half century, okay? So it's talking about the growth of this place which will later become New York or New Amsterdam. Um, it's talking about the difference between uh, directly importing from the continent and later on what they began to do when the English, because remember the English is now, the English captured Jamaica, the English have Barbados. So the, it's talking about the English now beginning to bring in, I'll read this little part here. In New York, Amsterdam, 
started New Amsterdam and later New York City, this reorientation of the slave trade and the importation of Akon speakers from the Gold Coast would have profound implications for the history of slavery and the development of African-American culture in the region. And we read about Gold Coast, a lot of Gold Coast slaves being in the Caribbean <clears throat> and how when they came to South Carolina, they started to get others because the Gold Coast, for many reasons that was enumerated yesterday. Okay, so this is more about the Dutch. I wanna read when it switches over to the English. <clears throat> Let me get something. All right, so now it switches over to the English, right? I'll start right here. The system of the company established simply did not provide a strong enough incentive to lure Dutch to the new uh, North America in sufficient numbers. And according to historian Ed Edgar Mac McManus, the prospect of living as futile, sorry, feudal dependence of a great landlord and almost no appeal to the ruggedly independent Dutch. Okay, because when they came here, whatever, whoever crown they was operating under had to lure the people over. So there was like the Dutch wasn't buying. The dearth of colonists during the early years of the Dutch settlement in North America provided an obvious impetus for the continued importation of African labor. This reliance on Africans was epitomized by the arrival of the last Dutch West India Company commissioned ship, the Gideon, in New Amsterdam in the summer of 1664. The Gideon carried a cargo of 300 from Loango in West Central Africa, representing 80%. So at this point, that this, this last ship from the Dutch represented 80% of the African population residing in New Amsterdam, 6% of Manhattan's total population, and 3% of the entire population of New Netherlands. The Gideon was also the ship that loaded the remaining Dutch soldiers from Fort Amsterdam after the company capitulated to English rule in September, 1664. So they passed in the baton, okay? So you got a last shipment. They told you that they came straight from the continent. They told you what percent of the population they represented. 80% at that time, they were of those who were here, okay? When the English takes control, the English changed a lot of things, okay? So I'm gonna jump down to right here. This is Africans made up roughly Oh, I'm not going to skip it because it's just right in the middle and it's going to it's going to take us over. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Actually, before I start reading, let me get this water. You can peruse it one second while I go get this water. All right, sorry about that. All right. Hope y'all was able to take a look over that for yourself. So here we go. Um, for those who just joined us, we're reading from the book, The River Flows On. <clears throat> and we're looking at who now is going to be fighting, bleeding, um, and being enslaved in New York after <clears throat> the English take control. Almost instantly, the English recognize slavery as a legal institution. The quote, Duke's laws. So this is something like me, I'm just gonna look this up. I'm not gonna do it now for the sake of time, but you see Duke's law. So you look it up and you like, what was that? What happened? What changed the tide? Passed a year after British rule was established, including provisions that allowed the practice of service for life. There was a lot of, you know, tricky stuff that happened that initially that wasn't the, that wasn't was, was on plan to happen. But as they got craftier, as the European went along, they started changing the laws and made it the perpetual servitude. It says, while the Dutch had never codified slavery, the experience of the Dutch West Indy Company in Atlantic Africa and Brazil gave its proprietors a keen understanding of the concept. And some Africans were already serving lifelong labor contracts before 1664. 
According to Joyce Godfrey with English control name, a constellation of laws governing the lives of slaves and which substantially restrict the latitude of so-called black people in New York City, the end of the Dutch rule in Manhattan made slavery a very real and lasting concept for its African inhabitants. So something changed when the British took it. The opportunity for Africans to obtain their freedom on land or even have their own pool of dependent European or African laborers would be completely shut off by the 18th century. Africans, so the, the last ship that came over from with the Gideon and those who came over, where, wherever they're about to get the next set from has a total different set of rules. Africans made up roughly 20% of New York City's population at the time of the British conquest. The steady influx of labor from the Caribbean and Africa initiated by the Dutch West India Company would persist under British rule, especially after the Royal African Company was chartered in 1672. Though the Royal African Company concentrated primarily on the trade from West Africa to the Caribbean, because like I told you, these dudes were commissioned and they had contracts like you would get a government contract today, they actively encouraged the reshipment trade in which private traders sold Caribbean slaves to New York and other North American colonies. So when you see later on that you have mass migration of people from the Caribbean coming here, like I said to, to a sister earlier today, it's like you have mass migration from state to state after slavery. You have people over here, people that you would have known, people that was robbed off the islands and sent to mainland. This is history. Though the Royal African Company concentrated primarily on the trade from West Africa, okay, I read that. In 1676, Sir John Worden noted that once the Royal African Company traded enslaved Africans from West Africa, and quote, when they were are once sold in Barbados, Jamaica, etc., by them or their factors, they care not whether they are transported from thence. And therefore, you need not suspect the company will oppose the introducing of black slaves into New York from any place except from Guinea. If they were first sold in that place by royal company or their agents. In this manner, New Yorkers could guarantee as many enslaved Africans as they needed and the population continued to swell unabated. Listen to this. By the 1730s, New York had the largest African population of any colonial city north of Baltimore. In fact, it was second only to Charleston, South Carolina, as the city with the highest concentration of Africans in North America. And here's the chart. What did we learn about South Carolina yesterday? 40% of the melanated bodies that came in came through South Carolina. Now we're having another a record of melanated bodies being enslaved in both locations. New York City population from 1664, you see at 1664 is 375. Those are coming straight off the continent according to what they said. By the time you get to 1737, you have 1,719 it, compared to 8,945 Europeans. And they're telling you what percentage of the population, okay? But I'm gonna jump down now because it gets more interesting, okay? I bid you to read these. I'm going to come to the comment section after I'm finished uh, reading this last little part here. We're going to go ahead and jump down. Here we go. Because remember, in um, right here, remember what I told you about the disconnect, what could have happened, what was going on, what was the climate, what was the atmosphere, what are we missing here in 2019? So we here, see here that the number of enslaved Africans imported from the Caribbean decreased. So this was a practice that went on for some time, for decades, after the New York City Slave Revolt of 1712. So let's go ahead and hop over there and see what happened with the New York City Slave Revolt of 1712. Okay? All right. New York City Slave Revolt of 1712. After midnight on April 6, 1712, a group of African slaves and some Spanish Indians set fire to an outhouse on a maiden lane owned by Peter Von Tilburg slave owner and res resident of the East Word. When unsuspecting whites arrived, so-called whites at the scene to stop the blaze from spreading, the group of about 30 armed with guns, knives, clubs, axes, and hatchets 
attacked them. Nine whites were killed and seven others injured before a militia unit stationed at the nearby garrison was notified. Governor Robert Hunter ordered a cannon to be fired from Fort Greene to warn others in the area about the revolt. This is another thing that the European is always, always has been and will continue to be concerned about. Um, the militia eventually dispersed the rebels who escaped to the north, northern forest of Manhattan Island. Of the 20, 28 individuals captured and facing charges ranging from murder to conspiracy, Governor Hunter writes, quote, 27 were con condemned, whereof 21 were executed. Some were burnt, others hang, one broke on the wheel, and one hung alive in chains in town, so that there has been the most exemplary punishment inflicted that could be possibly thought of. When we talk about the disparity in the justice system and why melanated bodies get harsher treatment, for similar crimes, um, a lot of this, a lot of these revolts and a lot of the information that went down is what shaped the, the codes and the laws that they used to later on continue to oppress. Six of the slaves killed themselves rather than be captured. On a practical level, suicide provided an escape from torture and public execution, though there were possible spiritual reasons tied to particular West African concepts for this action. Seven slaves charged in this case were reprieved and never tried. The master of each slave executed, received 50 ounces of pillar plate silver as a compensation for the provincial treasury. Three of the existing contemporary accounts of the New York City Rebellion of 1712 reveal sparse but insightful details regarding this uprising. This is very interesting. Listen to this now. The April 7th through 14th, 1712 edition of the Boston Newsletter which at the time was the only newspaper operating in British North America reported. Listen, I spoke about them and I posted it on the community board. So if you're looking at this and you subscribe, when I post stuff on the community board, feel free to take a look and let your thoughts be known, okay? I spoke about Comoranti Negroes because this was something that was brought up about <clears throat> a it. I'll just read it, how about that? Some Comoranti Negroes to the number of 25 or 30 and two or three Spanish Indians have conspired to murder all Christians here. This is the news report. They are, read all about it, extra, extra. And by that means, thinking to obtain their freedom. About two o'clock this morning, put their bloody design in execution. How many did they say died? A number of them. So, okay, but we'll continue. And setting fire to a house, they stood prepared with arms to kill everybody that approached to put it out. And accordingly, barb barbarously murdered persons that were running to the fire, upon which the town was soon alarmed, which occasioned the murderers flying into the woods, where several parties are set after them and have taken some who are committed and hope to take the rest before night. This has put, it, put us into no small consternation, the whole town being under arms, okay? So this was from the Boston, what was the name of that paper? This was from the Boston Newsletter, April 7th, 1712. The following week, the Boston Newsletter informed its readers of the fate of the rebels. These would have been people who fought, who resisted, who bled, and was murdered here. We have about 70 Negroes in custody, and tis feared that most of the Negroes here, who are very numerous, knew of the late conspiracy to murder the Christians. Six of them have been their own executioners by shooting and cutting their own throats. Three had been executed according to law, one burnt, a second broken upon the wheel, and a third hung up alive, and nine more of the murdering Negroes are to be executed tomorrow. I thought they were just trying to burn down the building and then y'all came, but now they say they came to Merkel's. But anyway, in a, in, a, in a letter dated June 23, 1712, Reverend John Sharp, chaplain of the English garrison in New York, provides a detailed account of the events from David Humphreys, the secretary of the Society for Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. Some Negro slaves here of ye nation of Camaranti and Papa plotted to destroy all the so-called whites in order to obtain their freedom and keep 
kept their conspiracy so secret that there was not the least suspicion of it, as formerly they had often been. So they, there was a, uh, anyway, till it come to the execution. It was agreed to on New Year's Day, the conspirators tying themselves to the secrecy by sucking the blood of each other's hand. So they went into a blood covenant and to make them invulnerable as they believed a free Negro who pretend sorcery gave them a, pow a powder to rub up their cloths, which made them so confident that on Sunday night, April 7th, about two o'clock, about the going down of the moon, they set fire to a house with alarming the town they stood in the streets and shot down and stabbed as many as they could till a great gun from the fort called up the inhabitants in arms who soon scattered them. They murdered about eight and wounded 12. More who are since recovered some of them in their flight shot themselves. One shot first his wife and then himself, wow. And some who hid themselves in towns when they went to apprehend them, cut their own throats, and many were convicted. About 18 had suffered death. Okay. So he he again says it's Kumaranti, but this is why this is important. Reverend Sharp visited and interviewed the condemned in prison, and on the way to the gallows, he spoke in particular to Robin Hugland, the slave of a prominent merchant named Hedrick Hugland. After being convicted of murder and the stabbing death of his master, Robin was sentenced to, quote, be hung up in chains alive and so to continue without any substance until he be dead, end quote. On April 11th, Reverend Sharp, certain of Robin's involvement in the revolt, visited him after the third day of his sentence in order to obtain a confession of guilt. So they, had, they strung this dude up for three days? During his, this session, Sharp notes that Robin was often delirious by long continuance in that posture through hunger, thirst, pain. But he then answered directly to what I inquired. So they tortured him. So that I might conclude he had some intervals of exercise of reason. Though he divulged heretofore unrevealed and uninvestigated aspects of the conspiracy and subsequent revolt. Robin claimed that he knew of the conspiracy, but was not guilty of any bloodshed in the tumult. Since Sharp's letter is the only account of the revolt referring to blood oath of loyalty and the anonymous conjurer, this additional evidence likely came from Robin, a slave who had firsthand knowledge of the plot. I'm going to go on because that's very interesting about how they, um, how they uh, revolted and what happened thereafter. But I want to jump down because this word Komorati keeps coming up. Again, for those who just joined this, I know that sometimes it's difficult to rock through a lot of reading, but thank you for bearing with me as I'm reading this, because this is what it takes. This is what it takes for us to be able to come to have an informed conversation about this particular topic so that we won't go about spewing rhetoric on videos and on the comment sections and everywhere else we go, giving misinformation to people who are not gonna take the time to do the research. That is not, that's not safe. Gold Coast origins of insurgents. And then I'm going to come and read the comment section um, to see what else has been said thus far. I'm not about call, name calling or jumping on people. I'm about this, about shedding light in dark places. So the Comoranti, they said it was the Comoranti. We read over here in um, Wikipedia that the number of enslaved Africans imported from the Caribbean decreased after the, the, the rebellion. And now we're reading about the rebellion. The term Comoranti and or Comorantin referred on to in two accounts of the revolt point to an import tent, important English trading post located on the Gold Coast of West Africa during the 17th and 18th centuries. Cromoranti was both a key commercial village controlled by the Fanti Kingdom of a futu and a major trading post established by the Dutch in 1598. Fort Cromoranti, located near the modern day village of Abanzi, was destroyed in 1645 and rebuilt later by the English. It was to become the first English trading post along the coast of the Gulf of Guinea. Fort Cromoranti and other coastal factories like it the English exported Africans principally to their Caribbean possessions throughout the 17th and 18th 
century. So who was the ones who were rebelling, whose blood was spilled, who were of great population when the English took possession of New Amsterdam, which later became New York? People who were doubly enslaved, once in the Caribbean and once on the mainland. During the Second Anglo-Dutch War, the Dutch West Indies Company seized Fort Comoranti and renamed it Fort New Amsterdam. And where's the figure? The figure is supposed to come up. Perhaps in direct response to the seizure of its namesake in New Amer uh, North America by British forces, as a result of the combined Fanti, English, and Dutch trading activities at Comoranti, Slaves exported from this region of the Gold Coast was lumped together and referred to incorrectly as Comorantin or Cromantin by European slave traders, factors, and ship captains during 17th and 18th century. Isn't good. While this ethnic term has its ambiguities, Cromantin does refer to mostly Akon speaking speakers from the Gold Coast who were transported to the Americas. <clears throat> Let me drink some water. Gold Coast Africans disembarked. This is the chart. This is the chart. They're talking about ethnicities. They're talking about the different ethnic groups of the melanated people who were brought here, okay? So this is an excellent book to cop. Now, when I talk about Jamaica having a disproportionate amount of Kumaranti Negroes because of the, what they later called them because of the, the uh, temperament of those particular, they started to get a bad name. They started to get a bad rap for people like we read who like doing what? Starting trouble, rebelling, you know what I'm saying? And all these things, so they cut it off. So in the beginning, you had, um, you had many in the beginning from 16 to 1700, more Comoranti was in Barbados, okay? But remember, Barbados is one of the testing ground, we read that. When Barbados gets begins to thin out and, and they begin to put who they preferred in Barbados, you begin to see that they, they started dumping more of this hot temperament, rebellious type in Jamaica. So by the time you get to 1700s to 1800s, it flips from Barbado having 52.5%. It flips to at, at 13,645, according to the number. At that time, Jamaica has 4,449 and all of the islands subsequently, right? By the time you get to 1700s, to 1800s, it flips to Jamaica having 162,550, 42% of the, the Gold Coast, so-called Gold Coast Africans, not so-called, Gold Coast Africans, they now have 42% and Barbados dropped down to 8.7%. These are the numbers, but then what we're reading begins to show you the practices that produce these numbers. We have to look at history. We can't just look at numbers like in the report we saw the other day and then not read the, the variables that contributed to these numbers. We have to look at history and what they're saying happened and what was going on for them to say, you know what, no more. We're gonna just dump you here. So Jamaica becomes this dumping ground. And what they started doing as we read was bringing them from Jamaica and Barbados and Antigua and beginning to put bring them into the colonies. And this started insurrections in the colonies, okay? I know I'm keeping repeating it. I know we lost a lot of people because I do see a lot that wants to be said and I'm gonna come. But again, <clears throat> I'm gonna just round this off right here. So we see the proof of them being in the colonies, of them having been in the Caribbean. Now, I don't know how long somebody has to be here to no longer have been enslaved in the Caribbean, but we see that, you know what I'm saying? They were enslaved in both places. <coughs> Okay, it's telling you about how much, what's the trading going on, where they're coming from, okay? At what times, to where? Okay, according to the Du Bois Institute database, the British Caribbean colony of Jamaica 
imported more Gold Coast Africans in the 18th century than any six colonies combined in the Western Hemisphere. Due to the marked concentration of Gold Coast Africans in the British slave trade to Jamaica, this island colony witnessed the formation of a number of Kumaranti or Akan speaking communities, providing insight into trading linkages and parallel cultural development in early 18th century New York. As the most lucrative colony in the British Americas, because of the sugar production that was going out of it, Jamaica and rum, which were they were, uh, you know, taking. Anyway, that's another story about that, how that whole thing went down. But as the most lucrative colony in the British Americas, Jamaica had an enormous demand for African imports. That's because the danger of producing sugar was crazy. It was crazy, but that's another story. Had an enormous demand for African imports. And they were saying it's cheaper to just get more people than to, so they had a short life expectancy plan for, you know what, if a slave dies, I'll just get another one because it's that much cheaper. It said it was a destination, destination of roughly 37% of all slave ships entering the colonies in British America during the 18th century. 37% of the slave ships was going to Jamaica. As a result, Jamaica became the center of important re-export trade. I mean, they came in, they sometimes worked them into Jamaica, and then they shipped them to the colonies. The most significant destination in the re-export trade were the were the Spanish colonies in the Caribbean and mainland South and North America. I'll read that one part again. The most significant destinations in their re-export trade were the Spanish colonies in the Caribbean and mainland South and North America. Jamaica was a port of where they were now getting the slaves from and bringing them to South Carolina and bringing them to New York. So when we, when the statement, I have to keep saying this, when the statement is said that their blood wasn't spilled here and we wanna make a difference about where you was enslaved at, but not really remembering who was coming here. Beginning in the 17th century, between 15 and 20% of all enslaved Africans were redirected from Jamaica to Spanish colonies via the much coveted here, the same thing I kept telling you about the ascent of the Negroes, right? Here it is. The much coveted and extremely lucrative Ascento, us or a slave trading license. This trade relationship peaked after 1700 and went through a protracted period of decline between 1748 and 1783. And why did we figure it went through a decline? Because there was like no more of these rebel rousers who don't want to be enslaved. They keep coming here and we're going to get our supply from somewhere else. And they were enslaved. Um, I'll just read a little more because I think I made my point and I gave enough information that we can go over. You can go over at your own discretion. So I'm only read one more paragraph and then for the sake of time, I'm going to come to the comment section. And this is delivered in love, family. This is love. You know what I'm saying? This is a labor of love. I happen to, I love, I like this. I like, I like digging in these books and, and, and getting, getting, getting some important history that can at least help to facilitate these type of discussions. <clears throat> it says, in addition to providing Spanish colonies with enslaved Africans, Jamaica was the center of transshipment trade network that connected to a number of British mainland possessions. During the 18th century, mainland colonies like South Carolina, Rhode Island, which was a big one, okay, Providence, Rhode Island. Actually, Rhode Island still has the word plantation in their name. How many people know that? Hold on. I'm going to pause for a second. How many people know Rhode Island's full incorporated name? It, is, it still has the word plantation in it. Hold on. Wait, let me, let me pull it up. I found out, out, and I thought that was wild. It shortened. Hold on. I forgot the name. It's like something, something. Plantation of Rhode Island. Here it is. Colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation. <laughs> that is wild. Wait, wait, no, that was from 17... 1776. That, yeah, that was, sorry, that was the fully incorporated name, Colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. That was the fully incorporated name. I believe, wait, did they still have it or did they drop it? 
I don't know why I felt like I read that they still had it. Yeah, Providence Plantations, there it is. Anyway, that was just a little, that was just a little side note, my bad. Let me get back on track here. <clears throat> it says, uh, Rhode Island, Virginia, Maryland, and New York received. So listen, listen to the states, y'all. South Carolina, Rhode Island, Virginia, Maryland, and New York received cargoes from Jamaica. Though this facet of intricate slave trade was much smaller relative to the Ascentos traffic. Because we know what happens after that. David Elitus est estimates that this trade brought no more than 400,000 Africans from the Caribbean into what became the United States. Is that a significant number? Almost half a million? Is that a significant number? This person, we would probably have to look up this person. Who, who uh oh, don't be messing around now. Huh? Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I done jumped on it, huh? Got all excited and David Eltis. Got to, I gotta look that dude up, see who he is. But according to him, he estimates that this trade brought no more than so, no more than what 400,000. Africans from the Caribbean into what became the United States? Into what again? South Carolina, Rhode Island, Virginia, Maryland, and New York. But the, but the thought is these immigrants didn't do anything for the building of the country. We can't say that. When we were just split up and just dropped in different locations and some of the stuff we forgot and some of the stuff we didn't remember. And that's the same thing. Is you finished or is you done? Y'all probably like, Amuna, is you finished or is you done? So I'm about to be finished just now. Based on what is known about the African ethnic groups imported into the British Caribbean, we can deduce the ethnic composition of some of the cargoes intended for British North America through the transshipment network. Four regions supplied about 90% of the enslaved Africans entering Jamaica during the course of the 18th century. Africans from the Bight of Biafra, like the Igbos, and others represented 34.5% of all Africans from identifiable regions and embarked on ships headed to Jamaica. There goes the Igbos. Africans from the Gold Coast, there goes so called Camaranti, what they named 28.9%. When West Central Africans, 14.5%. And the Bite of Benin, 11.2%, made up the remainder. The presence of heterogeneous slave population seemingly supports the claim made by Sidney Mintz and Richard Price who contend that traders and planters engage in purposeful randomization of African imports. I read that before because of the temperament of the Kumaranti. They tried to pair them with other cooler temperaments. So they would try to pair the Kumaranti with the Igbo to kind of water down that kind of warrior spirit. However, Jamaican planters who cho planters chose which enslaved Africans to keep and which ones to ship elsewhere resulting in a disproportionately high number of Akan speakers remaining on the island. Um, and again, this uh, Google link gives a lot, 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 lot of information. But for the purpose of, the, of what I was trying to, um, wait a minute, there was something else. Wait a minute, wait a minute, y'all. Something else. There you go. Wait, no, I ain't done yet. I ain't done it. My bad. I ain't done. I'm not finished. I'm not done. There's a little bit more. A little bit more. 18th century New York slave owners. 18th century New York slave owners had a strong preference for slaves directly from Africa, as opposed to listen, because remember what we we, we heard, and they're going to tell you why why they had a strong preference. Had a strong preference for slaves directly from Africa, as opposed to slaves imported from the British Caribbean. Do this, though this preference is not readily traced in the available import records, the partiality for direct African imports was ingrained in a series of import duties. We read that about South Carolina, where you had 30 pounds tax if you came from another colony and only three if you came from the continent. Why? Because those who had an opportunity to converse with one another was able to link up and try to overthrow their chains of their oppression. And they were like, we don't want that. And so we want to be able to break the person straight in here. 
The partiality for direct African imports was ingrained in a series of import duties. In 1702, for example, New York, so not only did South Carolina put a tax, New York began to tax imported slaves, a policy that would continue until the American Revolution. Slaves imported from Africa were taxed 15 shillings, while slaves from other American locales, including British Caribbean, were taxed at a rate of 30 shillings and above. By the 1720s, this rate of taxation had increased dramatically. Slaves imported from Africa were taxed two pounds, while others were taxed a double that amount. So again, this is <clears throat> built into the system, because remember, this is, you're talking about economy now, okay? And you're talking about preference. That's like saying, if I don't want Japanese cars, I'm going to put a higher tax on Japanese cars. The same thing you hear the president talk about taxing certain people so that it will be more expensive to import certain things for whatever the political reasons are. In this case, the reason was, I don't want you to keep trying to overthrow the system. So I want others, I'm going to make it more advantageous for those who did have the contracts to bring in others, even though it was further. Here's the other issue. You run into the Caribbean before you come to America. How much more weeks is it going to put on on your voyage to come all the way from the continent to South Carolina. It's going to put a lot of time on your voyage. And so a lot of them did not have, they weren't flying air, you know, air slave master. They were on boats. So to, to, to understandable that they're going to stop at other places to either refill, stock up, or unload the cargo, because the reality is the name of the game was getting people here before they die slow. That's the name of the game. So if they can get them here, and like the guy said, I don't care what they do with them after here, if they can get to Jamaica and fatten them up and break them in, then it's more likely than you're gonna fetch a high dollar price by just that short voyage from Jamaica to, or the Caribbean to America being stocked up from the Caribbean as opposed to coming straight from the continent. So we have to look at all of these things when we're talking about what's happening. One reason for the different import duty schedules was the notion that African ships from other colonies had unstable characteristics, such as a physical weakness or rebellious temperaments. And we already saw what they really meant because we just read it, it was rebellious temperaments. This assumption was epitomized in the 1718 African Duty Act passed by the New York City legislator. Hey, let's just do some field trips, shall you? 1718 African Duty Act. Hold up. And I'm going to come to everybody. There was something, I know I remember there was something else that I wanted. 1718 African Duty Act. I know we just probably read about it, which is boom. Mm -hmm. Suppression of African slaves. The act referred to is not to be found. <clears throat> so I see something over here in Google Books. This is what? The suppression of the African slave trade to the United States of America. Okay, this is something else. Uh, boom. Let me see right here. 1716. What did we just read? 1716. Okay, let's read 17. We did South Carolina last week, right? 1716, an act for laying an imposition on liquors, goods, merchandise imported into and exported out of this province for raising of a fund of money towards the defraying of the public charge and expense of the government. A duty of three pounds was laid on African slaves, there you go, and 30 pounds on, on American slaves. Again, from those who come from British American colonies. Let me see, they said 1718, so let me jump down here. So that's, this is how they began to systematically oppress and it further enslaved as they went along. 1717, December, South Carolina, a further additional act to act entitled an act for better ordering and covering of Negroes and all other slaves and to an additional act to an act. Okay, boom. So we found the one, I'm gonna crop this right here. Here it is. Well, this is Pennsylvania, an act for continuing a duty on Negroes brought into this province. Okay, but I'm gonna come back and read that. Again, the suppression of the African Slave trade to the United States in America. But I'll continue for the sake of time. In, in addressing Governor Hunter, the legislator ho hoped that this duty would not be viewed as inconsistent with British interests because of the difference between the duty of Negroes brought directly from Africa and those brought from the plantation. B 
because it will encourage a direct importation from Africa and discourage an importation from plantation by whom we are supplied with the refuse of their Negroes and such male factors as would have suffered death in the places from whence they came, had not the avarice of their owners saved them from public justice by an early transportation into these parts where they not often fail of repeating their crimes. In particular, and this is, this is I'm gonna I'm a wind down. In particular, Akon speakers from the Gold Coast were perceived to be the most recal recalcitrant group of the British Caribbean and were likely a sizable portion of the refuse and malfactors sold to New York on the eve of the 1712 revolt. So again, they we just read that they was keeping the best of the best, like they say, uh, the strongest for themselves. And they were sending those who, you know, they was picking all the pink annihilators basically. And those who did come and who weren't weakly and who did have strength wasn't trying to be enslaved again at another place. And they were starting rebellions. So you can read more at your own discussion. I think I have shared enough um, to kind of get this discussion going. I'm gonna release my screen. And then I'm gonna come to <clears throat> the comment section. Hopefully we've been keeping it clean and professional. Um, without the disrespect, I meant to say that before. I saw some comments. I didn't have an opportunity to come to them yet, but we have some comments where, like, you can disagree here, but like that whole cursing, being disrespectful, calling people out that name, like, don't you know? I don't do that here. You know what I'm saying? So if you if we can't speak with a respectable manner to each other, if we feel like we have to use profanity to each other, then just either curb your comment or don't comment, because then I'm just gonna. I'm just going to deal with it because this is this is the environment of disrespect that causes the issues that we have to continue, right? So I'm not going to allow certain levels of toxicity. Like I said, you can disagree, but you don't have to be cursing people out and 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 carrying on in that manner. So that's if that, and that's something that I I, I uh, sorry, that's something that I stand by because it, it keeps down all the madness. Okay, boom. Now we're over here. <clears throat> One tough guy. ADOS, house slaves, field slaves, fight to continue the legacy of slavery in order to secure the bag from Massa are not seeking freedom as Israelites. That's tough guy's thoughts. <clears throat> like I said, <clears throat> there, there's so many ways we can look at this. And thank you for your thoughts, One Tough Guy. There are definitely so many ways we can look at this. Um, and again, you know. As long as we're keeping it respectable, then it's cool. The way I chose to approach it is just to, to get some of the facts to dispel so that people can have, I don't have to tell anybody what to think. I, I'm just providing some of the research that can help them to make a clear decision. Now do the study. Now, what King, King Rod, welcome back to the conversation. You giving me, um, he said, now do the study on ADOS that were shipped to the islands next. I thumbs up the video too. How you gonna give me more um homework here, King Ra? And y'all didn't even get you you forward in this story. You should have been giving me this homework. You giving me more homework to do? It's all good though. But we we gonna still rock on this one because we got some more colonies, if I'm not mistaken, that we just read on. So we got some more colonies before we jump to uh to uh, th th there wasn't a lot of to my understanding, and I could be wrong. Uh, there wasn't th because America was the last to be developed. The, the way it was shipped was from the continent to the Caribbean and South America, from the Caribbean to the mainland. The mainland got the least amount of melanated bodies compared to everywhere else. Let's look real quick. How many shipped, how many slaves were shipped to America? Because when you say Americas, we have to look. And if somebody has that work, that's something that we have to look at. Um, how many were shipped to the mainland proper to North America? Let me see. How many? So you got to put North America because it's going to do everything. There's some people saying that it's less than 400,000. There's some people that's less than 4,000, which is interesting because that was the number that was given of the amount that there no more than 400,000 that was coming from the Caribbean. That's something I have to look into more. That's something I have to look into more. 
The plethora of things ADOS are looking for from the historical enemies are so numerous and so far reaching, they should only look to their own power only after entering their own land. Instead of this, this is from one tough guy. However, they're looking for these trappings exclusively from the mortal enemies. You had ADOS being shipped to the Bahamas. Okay, feel free to bring the research, brother. This is what we're about. Feel free to bring the research. Bring the, like right now, I brought the research. So I'm not just saying in general, this is what happened. I'm bringing the research that says, where did it happen? The time frame that it happened? From whom did it happen? This last book right here that I, that I dropped, um, The River Flows On, it, it's talking about, it even gave you the breakdown of where they came from on the coast which I thought was fly. I already got the book in my Amazon car. I'm about to cop this right if I get out for this because that book is everything. I like having physical books so that I can mark it up and remember places and do all that. So I'm def I know that it's on, on the online, but if you want it physically, um, then feel free to get that. Uh, they're looking for the enemies as their source of national exaltation, fulfillment, and self-empowerment and esteem. That's something that we can come back and have a discussion that is this discussion layered with something else? Is it more than reparations? What else is going on here? Sleepy says, how many of the Caribbean people in the U.S. today can trace their family history in the U.S. back to those Caribbean slaves brought here? That's a, that, I mean, I wouldn't say probably none because before this conversation, how many people actually knew that the people, this is why I say sometimes we got to let something digest before we jump onto something else. How many people before these three videos actually knew that this amount of um, relocated melanated bodies came from the Caribbean? So how can we jump over to well, how many people could trace when the reality is that there was a chunk of history that many, what, someone scoffed, actually it was King Ra. King Ra scoffed at me in the comment section when I told you guys that a number of people a significant number of people were relocated from the Caribbean. King Lot, tell the truth. Did you scoff at me? You scoffed at me. Now he's giving me homework, but he scoffed at me before. I'm going to continue. But what were the Caribbean people called in the 1700s? See, now we're playing games. This is what I asked. When I asked what is a quote unquote real African American, I got blasted because I asked a legitimate question. But here we are. I'm glad we're having a discussion. But here we are now trying to get proper definitions. If a person's family came here in the 17, 1800 from the Caribbean, oh no, you <laughs> see, see, this is this is see, we playing games now. Now the ADOS, their family has been here for slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, and Jim Crow. But how do they get absorbed? This is was the question that I had. <clears throat> I think this is the question that many people are having, and they're being deemed as enemies. I don't know why. <clears throat> we cannot first be content to claim what we don't even actually are willing to acknowledge. Now that the information is brought out that they came from the Caribbean, I am addressing the statement that Caribbean blood, so-called Caribbean blood, which what, what is that? That's just metal lady bodies that went to the Caribbean or were dropped there, that Caribbean blood did not build. This is what I'm addressing. I'm not looking at uh, the who's going to get reparations. I'm looking at the statement that was made that Caribbean blood so-called those who were dropped off in the Caribbean did not sweat, did not toil, did not labor, did not die on American soil and that their bones are not buried here. And I'm waiting for somebody to be like, you know what, Amuna? Upon further investigation, that statement is not true. I'm not talking about the bag. I'm not talking about who's trying to get the money. I'm talking about statements that are being made about certain populations of people that are not rooted in history. That's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> the ADOS movement is simply Phil Slaves. <laughs> okay, it's one tough guy. We're gonna come back and talk about that tough guy. Let me know if you, you want to have that. We when we get some reparation redress for the labor genocide, we're going to build mental health institutions with built-in cultural workshop mechanism for the trauma with the bag. <laughs> Thank you, King Ralph, for uh, updating us on that. I think ADOS people need to figure out why ADOS people having a separate identity is triggering. I don't have an issue with Caribbean people having a separate identity. Again, Sleepy, thank you for your thoughts. But again, I'm not sure why or how we're not understanding why the need for this particular homework is necessary. This homework is necessary because of a statement, a very instrumental foundational statement that is juxtaposing Caribbean Americans, so-called Caribbean Americans against African Americans or ADOS as it's being termed right now. 
This is what this is about. This is why this is I've said it like 50 million times why I personally am having this discussion or bring, bringing forth the, the information that I'm uncovering in research. This is why I'm having the discussion. Furthermore, I have some information to bring forth that Caribbean people don't have an issue because Caribbean people, um, how many umpteen years ago has been petitioning to get their own designation? Again, more history, not sure if this is being shared. I have to come back because this video is going to be long, but I have to come back and talk about how they have already gone to get their own designation. <laughs> so that's not what this is about. Not for me anyway. So hopefully we can be present at the conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like be, like be present in the moment about what is being shared now instead of like kind of deflecting into other spaces that are not really being talked about. Um, how many Caribbean people first generation and have asked, oh, here we go. <laughs> Again, like I said, how many people knew that this amount of melanated bodies from the Caribbean islands actually fought bled, died, and suffered during slavery. Can, can I get a, can I get, how many people knew this? How many people knew this? So that the work is not in vain. This is how we make strive. When we come to the line, we, we, are, we are not using other people as scapegoats that is not historically founded. It's not right <laughs> to use people as scapegoats and make blanket statements that are not true. This is what I'm addressing. So I'm not trying to play the how many game. I'm just trying to say, according to, and I've given you guys resources. This is not a Mona. Like, -doo -doo. I'm about to make some stuff up now. This is laying on the surface. I took you to Wikipedia, who gave you some clues. And then I took you over to some books that are actually free on Google Books. That shows you the migration pattern that shows you where they came from, and that shows you why that statement is not true. Okay, I grew up in Louisiana. I'm aware of Haitians that came and were brought to Louisiana in 1865. I consider, see, and they were from the Jim Crow reconstruction. And this is what I'm saying when we talk about what we consider, who is setting this parameter? Who is making these determinants? And it needs to be across the board. We can't keep moving the goalposts. Okay, there are no Caribbean people. Okay, boom, we find out it's Caribbean people. Boom, now I consider you. You know what I mean? It, it's like, how we how is this being done? And is it is it truthful? But thank you for your thoughts. Uh just to, uh there has been always there has always been a private identity, and black American has always been a black American separate identity from Nigerian, Jamaican, Haitian. Just keep immigrants' name out of the pity party. This is what. <laughs> Feel free to share more or your thoughts on that. Now here comes King Ra. I see you playing games today. I'm not even going to. 400,000 ain't a lot. No problem. It, 400, it's 400,000 more than just. I heard the discounting of, um, oh, Marcus uh, Marcus Garvey is just one. And I heard um, Malcolm X is just one. And Stokely Carmichael is just one. And I'm talking about a nation of people. Now I show you a nation, 400,000 in 1860 something or 1760 something. That's a nation of people. 400,000? Yeah, that's a nation. Uh, now, the use of the term pity party highlights the problem. White racists have used the same term in regards to ADOS people, just pointing out the similarities in the stem of the thinking of immigrants and white people, or so-called white people. The fact that people aren't criticizing neighboring and Caribbean people that aren't seeking reparations from Journey and the UK, respectively, is telling. And again, when we make statements like this, can we find that Caribbean people are not being criticized for their actions. Because like I'm saying, when we make statements like, uh, like this, I, I like to say like, where is this happening or where is this not happening? And can we validate the claims that we're making that it's not happening or that it is happening? So that like you said, when these are the problems, I appreciate you Sleepy for saying what you're receiving in the discussion and what is a trigger, right, to make you feel like, or, or where somebody would say, make you an enemy of ADOS by saying things such as pity party. On the other side, the other person may be saying, well, look, the facts are being presented and they're still being discounted. They're still being pushed away. They're still being minimalized, right? And so, um, oh, hey, shout out to Sister Only Love in the House. What's going on? What's going on, sister? 
So King King Ra, you come my new friend. What I'm King Ra, you subscribe? King Ra, come and subscribe. You subscribe. So what is your personal end goal for pushing this conversation? Like I said, King Ra, I went through um yesterday. Let me uh, since you're here now, I'll just answer the question. I'll just ask you the question by sharing my screen. You ready? I'm gonna share my screen with you. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Hold on. Da, 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 de, da, de. King Ra asked me a question. What's my personal end game? I'll share it since you're here with me, all right? This is not a new discussion for me. Number one, I have been having discussion, not necessarily around the bag, but a, a, around he healing historical trauma. You are on currently the Solonomics channel. In 2016, I was thinking that part of the issue is our lack of understanding collectively and individually with some of the things that have come before us. And so my mission um, is to have these discussions that will facilitate um, or facilitate discussions that will, 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 will hopefully lead to healing. Okay. One of the things I did back in 2016 was for a whole year, instead of complaining about one month of Black History Month, I said, yo, why don't we do a left project for the whole year? A left project means lift every voice. That's the name of the left project. It's where I invested my time, energy, and money into obtaining narratives and spending time on the computer like I'm doing now and reaching out to people I know and don't know to have these very tough dis discussions. There's over 100, there's 100, over 100 videos of me having the left project, speaking to people, reading from the words, giving resources about what happened and what continued to happen and how it has affected us. So this is just a love project, okay? What is my end game? My end game is healing. Now, if that's a part of what everybody's talking about, hey, that's cool. However, my end game is accurate retelling. Hold on, I'm not trying to get to know uh, Facebook. An accurate retelling of what has happened. So this is not something that I just like, ooh, ADOS, ADOS, let me hop on it. That's not what happened. But let me uh, let me see here. Lev Project. If you go and click the Lev Project and you look up my name, right? Within that year where we first started. Hold on. In the year, I'm trying to find it for you here. Come on, crazy computer. So my point is I have a vested interest because I talk about healing. Solonomics is about healing. I talk about personal trauma and collective trauma. And a lot of times because I'm not necessarily controversial and I'm not being hype uh, and I'm not doing all of these things, you know, it doesn't get the traction as talking about necessarily celebrity gossip or whatever the case may be. Okay. This is a little bit about who I am. This was this was uh this was um the conversation about hold on let me that's not that's the video of me talking about the left project but I kind of wanted the article then I'm trying to find the article y'all Solonomics is on let me just do a little plug right like they say do a plug Solonomics is on this is me this is Solonomics it is on um, Amazon, has been on Amazon since, what year is this? Hmm. 2016, okay? And this is a self-help guide. You can click it, you can go in it. I'm an author, you know what I mean? Among other things, you can click it and go into what I'm talking about, what I have been talking about. Uh, in giving thanks for having life and awareness of how precious our soul is to this life, wisdom declares that with each human interaction, we must be prepared to give our best. Again, as I give many thanks to this beautiful woman, Ramona Yisrael, for her time spent with me in countless conversation about universal creation, the gift of breath of life, humanity, the soul, our faith, and how it affects and affects generation to generation. I hope the information on each page of this book provides knowledge and wisdom so that everyone can transform their human interactions and master their soul journey to the fullest. This is Solonomics. It's, a, it's an actual book, okay? And I don't know where the other thing is. Let me go on Google. I'm gonna, so hopefully that answered your question about what my end game about this discussion is. 
Okay, hold on. We're going to come to some of the thoughts because I don't shy away from, from them. I just wanted to, uh, let me see. I'm on harder today. Let me see, left project. Rockside, I can't find it. Y'all gonna make me have to go, let, let go of my screen and find this thing, so hold on. I'm going to let go of my screen while I'm talking and find it, and then I'm going to come back with it. But let me read some of these comments. Hold on one second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It says here, Eddie Osmilman is a... Oh, wait. Uh, let me share my screen a little bit more. Yes, baby? What, what, wait, I'm coming. What is Shiloh? Okay, okay, I'm coming. I'm, I'm coming. Go that way, Malaya. My computer is uh, freezing up. Hold on. Okay, what's one of the questions while my computer is freezing up? One of the compression is... Uh, Okay, Leithan says the ADOS is an integrationist movement and defeats the whole purpose of reparations. There's no reparations without separation. Um, King Ross says, and uh, okay, that's a thought that we can we can have a discussion about. Uh, I knew Africans came through the Caribbean to U.S. It was a business. Ah, uh, King Ross, you playing games today? You playing games? How come that's not being said then? How come that's not being? Uh, how come that's that? How come it's making it look like? Though there are those who are just coming after the fact so that they can get the bag. How come that's the narrative that's being like, where's the love? You know what I'm saying? How come that's the narrative that's being put out there into the blogosphere that melanated people who are enslaved in the Caribbean, now they done came out of their enslavement and they just come into America to get the bag when the reality is that's not the truth. When the reality is they were here, they were shipped over here. You did have separations of families that happened. And many people, after they were emancipated, did come here as well. It's the same thing, like I said, now my computer is, my computer is, um. uh-oh. Let me see if I'm still on. Computer was tripping, y'all. Computer was tripping. Hold on a second. 
So um, I'm not sure where y'all heard uh, we left off at, but um, I'm going to wrap this up. The babies is over here. Hi, woman. Uh, the computer was tripping. So we have, um, I think I showed you the end game. Uh, that's where it kind of, uh, what's my end game? Like I said before, the end game is about what I've always been about, healing, facilitating healing discussions. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we experience the trauma individually and collectively. We need proper information so that we can make proper decisions and so that we won't be emotionally vulnerable to um, things that trigger us and by extension then be manipulated because of said trigger, okay? Um, this is how, and I showed that in my recent videos of all the blackface conversation and how everything, every time that this pops up, we're triggered into how could they do this? Why would they do this? And that's the reaction that shows that they, to a certain degree, still have control over the people because we haven't processed it. So now when they, you know, when they're still doing stuff, it affects us to a certain degree. You know what I mean? And so <clears throat> that's the importance of healing in my estimation. Uh, let's see here. Um, King Ross said, I've been new Africans came through the Caribbean. I, I said, I, why didn't you share that with us, King Ross? Why did you scoff at me with the whole bar, with the whole um, South Carolina Jamaican connection? You see what I'm saying? And like I said, I don't know if you guys heard me, but if you did know that, then you should have shared it with us so we wouldn't have to go through all this research and so that we wouldn't have to hear statements that are not necessarily true. But thank you for that. When the ODOs movement gets this, they will help. Will they help Caribbean guess this? The Caribbean is already doing it. They're actually, Caribbean has been doing it. Um, is they're doing actually i was going to come and speak about somebody posted on the video and i want to thank you some of the strides that have been, been taken like i said before the last time i saw carrie Com went to them they was like we ain't got nothing for you <clears throat> but somebody showed me something recently that they were able to prove that um uh, certain universities were founded by slave monies but in actuality something of that nature happened here i forgot what um what college was it that realized that they sold the slaves, enslaved peoples to get the startup money for it. And when they've chased down their, uh, I'm gonna look it up right now. When they found their descendants, they gave them free access to the college. It was one of the Ivy League schools. Owns, Ivy League school owned part in slavery, gives descendants free tuition or something like that. It was it was some time ago. Here it is. It was 2016. So is this a form of reparation? Georgetown to offer. Here it is. Let me let me pull it up on the screen. So when I say I'm paying attention, and this is not this is this happened in 2016. Oh, sure. Now everything is trying to happen here. Where's the? Hold on, y'all. Y'all about to get cut off. Uh oh. Let me hurry up. Where the battery go out? Hold on one second. Hold on. I don't know what that was. Okay. Let me give y'all this real quick. This was from 2016. This is from 2016. September. CNN money. Georgetown to offer slave descendants preferential admission status. This is 2016. In an effort to acknowledge its ties to slavery, Georgetown University will offer the descendants of nearly 300 slaves preferential treatment in its admission process. In 1838, the school sold 272 slaves who were working on plantation in Southern Maryland to pay down its debts. Now that the school said it will give the descendants of those slaves quote, the same consideration we give the Georgetown community, end quote, when they apply, that means that the, the application will, quote, receive an extra look, end quote, and that the relationship to the university will be considered. Georgetown President George DeGoyo, okay, hopefully I already messed that up, officially recognized the school's past Thursday afternoon in a press conference. We must acknowledge that Georgetown participation in the institution of slavery there were slaves here on the hilltop until emancipation in 1862. 
Georgetown will also have a mass reconciliation where it will apologize for its history. We cannot do our best if we refuse to take ownership of such a critical part of our history. So this is the second time in two days, we heard South Carolina, the city of Charleston, owning its part and looking to do what it needs to do. And the melanated people who are connected to that town, they were present and they need to push. And now we have Georgetown saying uh, they did it and, and they, they, they got to pay up for their, their part. Last September, DeGaio created a 16 member working group of slavery, memory and reconciliation consisting of students, staff and alumni to make recommendations on how the school can amend its historical ties to slavery. Keep in mind, it's the it's the it's the it's HR 40 is the is to is the recommendation to study slavery. So Georgetown put together its own committee to do just that, to help find and connect with the sentence. The group created the Georgetown Slavery Archive, which provides genealogical information and other materials about slavery at the university. It has it also has documents that show the names, ages, and relationships of 272 sold sold in 1838. Some defendants have reached out to the school and have provided additional information, according to Adam Rothman, a history professor at Georgetown, who was also a member of the working group. A group of descendants who attended the press conference addressed the Gavio and asked the school to seek more of their input as it moves forward on how to rectify its past. The Gavio has visited with descendants in recent months and said that the school will support reconnecting the descendants of slaves who were split up when they were sold. We have a very good records in our archives, more than a hundred boxes, he said. Max Crump, whose great great grandfather was among those sold in 1838, told CNN's Brooke Baldwin that she was overcome when she heard about the news. I was driving at the time and I felt like my car was going to going, but I had stopped. It just took over my whole being. It was a door that opened that I never expected would have opened in my life. Along with the mission's treatment, the school will create a, memor a, a, a memorial to honor 272 enslaved men, women, and children, create the Institute of Slavery and its legacy, and also rename two builders that have been named after presidents who facilitated the 1838 sale. <clears throat> this is the kind of stuff, I'm put that link in the box too. This is the kind of stuff I wouldn't know this stuff off the fly if I wasn't really about that life, as some people say. I wouldn't have these resources just floating around in my mind if I didn't pay attention to this stuff. So hopefully that was helpful. So we've seen people in their individual spaces that were that was one of the things. If you listen to the um the thing I shared that people have been sharing about the uh court hearing before, it was about being able to pin down like they did in this Georgetown study, exactly who was affected. And as you can see in this Georgetown study, there are resources now that if somebody says, hey, my descendants are from this area, then you do the work. You go in there, you do the work, and you be like, okay, boom, it was, you know, grandma says such and such, let me click and let me start digging and let me start looking and let me start finding out, you know? And that will help to kind of uh, deal with some of this anxiety around people asking questions. Mm. Let me see here. Okay. Uh, I saw a Jamaican Canadian woman called call ADOS, Little Black Beggars, yesterday in regard to reparations. Well, let hit me up. Let me know where she at. I would love her to come and have a discussion because this is how we get rid of uh, uh, certain mentalities is by, I, you know, I'm the type of be like, yo, come through and have a discussion. Like I said, I want to have a discussion, an open discussion from people who are on all sides of this table. And if we engage in respectable dialogue, we can get to the bottom of some of these disparaging comments. Um, she then went to praise Caribbean people for seeking reparations. There is a double standard. And I would say if that's what she said, if it's in the comment section or somewhere, Sleepy CSS, feel free to let, you know, put it down there. I'll go over there and ask her if she want to come to a conversation, you know, because it's, sometimes it's easier to say that thing, to say things when you're not looking at people or you're not interacting real time. You know what I mean? Or you, but but when you have to interact with the person and now it's a person and not just a, 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 a straw man, it becomes something else. We have to level up in our discussion. Are you referring to? Oh no, you're talking to somebody else. Um CARICOM hasn't challenged, hasn't been challenged by ADOS. Do ADOS have a say? <clears throat> Did CARICOM does does ADOS have a say in CARICOM? 
Um, as a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah, see, people be like, Amuda. As a matter of fact, let me scan my screen again because I came across, let me first pull it up here. Oh man, it's on my other computer. I came across, what was the name of the organization again? Oh, I shared it in the first video. Hold on one second. Let me go get it. Because they wrote up an article on CARICOM. How about we come back and talk about that? Because we're running long. We're going to write the article they wrote up on CARICOM and CARICOM looking to get their designation. They didn't see CARICOM as an enemy. Actually, um, what's the name again? NARC, N-A-R-N-A-R-N-A-A-R-C. Um, that has Professor Winbush on um, the committee as well. They they are looking and working with CARICOM and seeing what CARICOM has done and how it's working and not working and then tweaking their own program for American reparations. So you also have someone else on this side. It's not in COBRA, it's NAARC, who also are not seeing CARICOM as an enemy, but as, as an ally. So to that question, we'll come back and talk about that, that connection. Um, he says he supports CARICOM. Yvette Carnell has discussed the need for dialogue therapy for trauma. You are spot on about the need for healing. Thank you for that, Sleepy. Uh, Leah says, no family is Jamaican, so I'm exempt. You exempt? Y'all are funny. We need to have this discussion. I just shared, uh, like I said, um, a discussion that's coming out of Ghana and the perception of um, so-called, uh, the perception of both people on both sides of the water. Okay, and how there's a disconnect. So definitely I would say that a conversation continues need to happen, but respect, respect, I can't stress this enough, respect has to be at the center so that we can hear one another. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm taking the time to read everybody's comments, even if I don't necessarily agree with everything, at least I'm taking the time to, to acknowledge you as a person, first and foremost, um, before I jump and say I don't agree. Uh, King Ron, when we, when we get our claims, ADOS should be in support of Caribbean then. The main reason you've probably seen some little pushback from ADOS narratives is mainly due to some West Indian immigrants in America who like to antagonize. And, 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 and you know, like I said, it's on both, I would have to say fairly, it's on both sides. For instance, uh, if you listened in yesterday with the South Carolina, I wouldn't say no, I wouldn't say no, King Ron. I would say if you listened yesterday to the South Carolina uh, conversation when I remembered about, um, and I went and found a video, it was called Hey Man um, from uh, In Living Color. And when you went and look at how, it, at that time, if you were here in the 90s and Living Color was big, and you look at how In Living Color stereotyped a lot of people, I would say, In Living Color stereotyped a lot of people, but one of the skits was around the hardest working Jamaican family and stereotyping uh, the Jamaican uh, worth ethic and projecting this to the populace at large. Not saying, like I said, that Certain stereotypes wasn't already here before a living color, but a living color was speaking to what was already being said in society. And again, like I said, this is built upon the issues that was even from the time of slavery that you had Caribbean people. Again, I have to bring up roots because you see it. In Fiddler, like I'm gonna get a little fictional because sometimes people get mad at me for going through roots, but hey, you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a fictional, historical fiction. Let's call roots that, it's a historical fiction. When Fiddler, is using disparaging remarks towards Kunta be, being an African Guinea. And some people will be like, well, why are you talking about him like that? Because the thought is that the more broken in you are, the less of a threat to the system you are. So the, the wilder you are, the more prone you are to insurrection, sometimes it can be looked as you're getting us in trouble, dude. You feel me? And so there's an indifference because like we saw in the thing in the mid 1700s, they begin bringing in mainland continent. So now you already have that versus. You have the, the 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 a lot that are being enslaved in two places. Imagine being enslaved in one place, kind of like being enslaved in Virginia. We read a book like that, and then being taken to Mississippi and being enslaved again. And you like this again? I believe it was Charles Barr's Ball, Fifty Years a Slave, where he he escapes to freedom and they recapture him and enslave him at a whole nother plantation. I'm, I was born in Brooklyn. My parents are from, uh, I was dropped off in Jamaica. So I would, so that's where I was born, but my parents were dropped off in Jamaica. So I, I experienced, you know, interfacing with what people are saying, or, 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 or today the term is ADOS. Like I grew up in New York and in Florida and had both those experiences um, and not necessarily 
subscribing to the fullness of, although you, I've heard it and seen it on different sites, I personally didn't subscribe to name calling, calling people out their names and doing all that stuff. I look at people for people. Right. It's right, but some do not. Like you said, Sleepy, many love to be stereotyped as hardworking. It's part of the model minority stereotype. But then they didn't give themselves that stereotype. <laughs> you say, I'm so exempt. <laughs> Look, I'm not I'm not running on the bag right now. I'm talking about healing. The rest, you know what I'm saying? I'm, that's the that's the that's the what I'm looking for. I'm talking about healing. But I hear you. That's what I'm saying. I when people say that, I, I take it, you know, I don't I don't get offended off of that because that's really not my objective. And it hasn't been, you know what I mean? But it's all good. Um, ADOS had reparation movements in the past. The efforts are hampered by Pan-Africanist organizers trying to include continental Africans, Caribbeans, Afro-Latinos, and bringing up Zionism. Um, uh, let me get the name of this. Let me get the name of this group here. I shared it before, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it again. Their name is, and I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you. Oh man, I'm long today, boy. Yeah, got me. And once I start talking about this topic, I'll be going all the way in. My goodness. It is called uh oh no, don't do that. Like I collect articles, news articles, you know, all the stuff as I go along because again, my thesis, I have a thesis in my mind, right? And I've shared this before. My thesis to understanding the trauma that has happened in slavery is along the lines of I've dropped the joy the group. Um, but when I look at uh when I look at the institution of slavery and I look at the study that has been done on domestic violence, and I've been saying this, I actually have a video on this channel. I say if we look through the lens of domestic violence, then we can properly ask we can properly assess the emotional and mental and spiritual trauma that has been done because slavery in large degree um, is studied for different reasons, but domestic violence, if we look at slavery as a domestic, a textbook definition of domestic violence, and we look through that lens, then we already have all the resources. Because what I realized is that a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists, when slavery is there, they shy away. But if they can talk about domestic violence, then they're gonna give us all the information and all the studies and all the intel, right? But when you talk about slavery, because it might implicate implicate them, they don't give us that ammunition. So when I read a book that's written by, um, called Trauma Bond, and he's going through all of these places that a trauma bond could be formed, but slavery is nowhere in sight, but the Holocaust is, or but um, what's the next thing that he put in there? The Holocaust and something else. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know what I'm saying? So then I, I started to say, hold up. As I'm reading these books side by side, I said, you know what? They've already done the research. They just haven't put the right people in there to be honest about who it really is applying to. Hold on. And then I'm, I'm going to be, the babies are calling me out, the babies are calling me. Uh, if, <laughs> uh, back to the stereotype of, uh, back to the stereotype of um, hard working, um, Again, it's not only just being perpetuated by melanated people who dropped off in the Caribbean. It's being perpetuated by those. It's like the it's like the it's like the Mexican stereotype. It's the same thing. But when you do look at some Mexicans, one would have to say this is what's going on. Um, and this is how they're being perceived by the outside world. It's called the Institute of Black World 21st Century, IBW21.org. That's the name of the site. And um, they talk about US reparations and they also let, let you know what's happening in CARICOM and what are the advancements that's happening in CARICOM. And then they they modeled, let me let me put it up here. They modeled in recent, I think three years ago, they modeled a reparations plan similar to what ADOS is doing. They modeled the reparations plan. Here it is. This is the website here. I shared it on uh, two days ago, ibw21.org. And then if we look up, we're talking about reparations and all that stuff. Hold on. Uh, 
Hold on, I spelled it wrong. Hold on, let me go back. Hold on. I just saw the thing before, news article, what we do. Hold on. Let me see this article real quick. Here, this is the that proud African policy agenda. Is that it? No, that's not it. This is something new. That's not it. But they have a number of things. Check it out as well. We'll come back and talk about it. I wasn't prepared to go through the whole thing, but they do have a discussion on reparations. Hold on there. I'm in a... Here it is. It's NARC. It's a, it's a derivative. I knew that there was a reason why I wasn't final. Uh, National African American Reparations Commission. So this is not involving Caribbean people um, in this particular thing. Um, this one is not because, uh, but they don't, they don't like disparage CARICOM. That's the, that's a bit of the difference that I'm seeing. This National African American Reparations Commission, um, you see here, this is what's going on here. It has quick links. It has what it's about. It has the 10 point reparations plan. It has why they formed. It established in 2015, the National African American Reparations Commission. Okay. It tells you who's on here. They have Dr. Ray Winbush. This is how I found it. Um, he had the book, Should America Pay? Um, Jeremiah, Dr. Jeremiah Wright, Professor Ogletree, Conrad, all of these elders, professors, psychiatrists, all of the, you know, all of the, these things that are going on here. Danny Glover is involved, it appears. Reparations Action Plan for Activists, Organizers. But these seem to be older. Um, people who may have the uh, experience and the knowledge, but the, not the, the the young blood to push it. And ADOS has the younger blood, the internet um, generation to kind of push what's going on. But they do speak to, I just wanted to show that they're here and they're not necessarily taking away anything from CARICOM by doing what it is that they need to do on the homeland. So, this was 2015. They roll out in 2015 the preliminary point reparations plan. And they got the preamble and all that good stuff. Okay. Now, on the same website, if you look up CARICOM, they're following CARICOM closely because CARICOM um, pushed forward an agenda and they're modeling certain things, like I said, and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work. And then you will see them following what's going on over there. And then whatever just clicked off my thing. So I don't, here it is, CARICOM, okay? And they find, because CARICOM is a collective of um, Caribbean countries, Cuba, Jamaica, Barbados, it's, it's South America, CARICOM is a collective. So anyway, I just want to show you that. It's just more research. I'm gonna stop presenting now. I hope everybody enjoyed. I thank you for staying, having the discussion, being respectful. Um, let me see, lastly. Yep, it did, it did. Hey, mine is a living color skit stereotype. All oh, y'all hardworking, that's all working. That's what I'm saying. And that, and, and that's, that's the stuff that we have to have conversations about and be like, yeah, I did that. Or yeah, I said that, let's just be honest. You know what I mean? Their, their thought process of and and that and that indifference for many melanated <clears throat> people who are or mainland from as far as they can remember it's like why are you why are you saying that like I said and somebody questioned whether or not my husband uh, uh, family is mainland uh, and have been here for some time as they can remember but they're hardworking you know what I'm saying so this stereotype. I don't necessarily subscribe to it, but there are people who don't know any better um, that don't that that do subscribe to it. But you have people of different personalities on both sides of the spectrum, or on all sides. You have hardworking people and you have lazy people. You have honest people and you have dishonest people, right? <clears throat> the U.S. has a caste system that places ADLs at the bottom. I've seen it at my job. No one wants to acknowledge that the U.S. has a caste system based on race and lineage. 
We can come back and talk more about that. We can come back more and talk about that and try to see the root of it, ex you know, express what we're experiencing in individual spaces because someone can say, you may experience that and somebody else may not experience that, right? And so then we're talking about subjective experiences and sometimes what we do is discount someone's experience because we didn't experience it. And then we talk about policies. If we're talking about policies that are in place, that's one thing. If we're talking about personal experiences, that's another. If we're talking about history, you know what I mean? That's another. My voice is gone, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up. But thank you for that. They also never bring up slavery when you talk about epigenetic and trauma. They, yep, they sure will, and that's what I'm saying. When, when you talk about epigenetics and trauma, it'd be like, do, 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 do. And then as soon as you try to bring up slavery, oh, you're making an excuse, oh, you're, you know what I mean? And so that's why I was like, no, if it can be proven that this is, slavery was the textbook definition of domestic violence, then we don't need you to sign off on it. You already did the work. Thank you very much. Now we're just going to line it up line for line and parallel all of the things that you said based on this, this would happen, right? <clears throat> That's the way I've chosen over the years to, to begin to develop that thought. Um, one of the leaders of ADOS movement, Yvette Carnell supports Caracon and the now being respirated reparations efforts. That's awesome if she, if, I wish I would have heard that when I tuned into her video, you know what I'm saying? This is what I'm saying. <clears throat> and I'm not saying no, she may have a space where she supports CARICOM and at the same token, like um, I think someone just said, you know, then you're calling people names, you know what I'm saying? Or you're saying things like in this case that are not true. You feel me? So, okay. Um, the people who control these your governments globally know who is who better than we do. This is true. It is better for us to go on history lesson crusades. Is it smart for us that step on toes of reparation movement? Ah, uh -uh. see, King Rod, you're gonna be my new favorite subscriber. <laughs> King Rod, look, you call it a crusade of history lessons? You can't, you can't build something. King Rod, I'm gonna have to come back and talk to you about this. If you're gonna, you can. Is it fair? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna turn the question. Is it fair to go on reparations movement by disparaging other people groups and making them the scapegoat? It's fair to go on history lesson because the study, the proposal to study, rep let me pull it up. Y'all keep drawing me in. Why y'all keep drawing me in? I said I was going to leave y'all. What sounds it? Not side two hours. I'm going to do this last thing. I'm going to do this last thing. I'm going to do this last thing. I'm gonna do this last thing. Why? I'm gonna answer King Rod's question. Okay. It says, This is true. However, I can recall when African Americans referencing each other disparagingly. This is also true. That everybody's implicated, man. As an adult, I look back at a living color and cringe. The show was filled with really problematic skits. Yes, indeed, it was. Yes, indeed, it was. Now, King Rod, this one is just for you. King Rod asked the question. <clears throat> Is it smart for us to go on history lesson crusades that step on the toes of reparation movements and others? I'm gonna share my screen one more time. One more time. Okay? I'm gonna share my screen. Do, 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 do. <clears throat> I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the boil that what it is, what's being pushed for is, is the bill to study reparations okay one more time hr 40 commission to study so you ask the question should we be doing this based on the based on what this is about this is a commission to study reparation proposal for african american act so yes 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 if one wants to be qualified one has to study. If one wants the bag, one has to study. So if one says that they fall within a category that qualify for the bag, the next thing you have to do is be able to prove it. Okay. John Conyers, it tells you the history. This thing was announced in 1997. We are in 2019. It's 22 years later. Okay. This thing is introduced and reintroduced, but more than that, let's jump a little bit into the details. Okay, wait, let me get into the text, hold on. All right, boom. 
This is the text of the bill. How many people have read the text of the bill? HR 40 in the House of Representatives. This was 2009 because they've been updated since sometime since then. Okay, a bill. This is what the this is what the fight is for. This is the push to approve this because this needs funding. This is not to get the reparations. This is get to funding like how Georgetown did the study with the committee. This is to put together the committee to receive the funding to study, then to assess how much damage was done. A bill to acknowledge the fundamental injustice, cruelty, brutality, and inhumanity of slavery in the United States and the 13 American colonies between 1619 and 1865. That means the stuff that I'm sharing is important because it falls between 1619 and 1865. And it, it means that American colonies was accomplice to the Caribbean in transporting and body trafficking and Rod Gill stealing flesh from one place to another and breaking up families. So it's not, it didn't just start here. It says, and to establish a commission to examine the institution of slavery. This is what they want to do. Establish a commission to examine the institution of slavery. Subsequently, de jure and de facto racial and economic discrimination against African-Americans. So that means you have to go back to 1695 before you can get up to present day of how it affected today. And the impact of these forces on living African-Americans to make recommendations, the same thing Georgetown just did three years ago, to the Congress on appropriate remedies and for other purposes. This is not yet to get the bag. This is to, yes, this is to study how to get the bag. That's what this is. Okay, short title. And then it goes into findings and purpose, right? And it lays it out. John Connors, they proposed this. And then it tells you the purpose. We'll come over here and read it another time because we're going long. When you get to the bottom, why they need approval is because it to get all of these um to get all of these lawyers and doctors and historians on board, you're going to have to pay them. It says here, membership, number and appointment, section four. The commission shall be composed of seven members. Listen good. Who will be appointed within 90 days after the date enactment of this act. That means say they say, yeah, I'm for reparations. I'm going to give reparations, the commission to study. What happens three months later? is that they're gonna have seven members. Three members shall be appointed by the president. Three members shall be appointed by the speaker of the House of Representatives. One member shall be appointed by the president pro tempore of the Senate. So even when they talk about the study, it's not like, oh yeah, we just get to put, pick whoever it is that we want, right? It says here, um, it says here, all members of the commission, shall be persons who are especially qualified to serve on the commission by virtue of their education, training, or experience, particularly in the field of African-American studies. So you're talking about your African-American professors. You're talking about the people who have put 50, 60, however many years in the game. You're talking about civil rights lawyers and just, you're talking about this is the people who they're gonna put on the commission to study. Terms, the term of office for members shall be for the life of the commission. A vacancy in the commission shall not affect the powers of the commission and shall be filled in the, num in the same manner in which the original appointment was made. First meeting, listen to this, you're reporting to the president. The president shall call the first meeting of the commission within 120 days after the date of the enactment. So you have 30, 90 days to get your commission together. And then you have 120 days to show up or within 30 days, that means you're supposed to have all these people already lined up. That means you're supposed to be have alliances with all of these people. You're supposed to have all these people already lined up. So when you look at um, when you look at what uh, NARC is doing, they have the people lined up. This is why they have so many people lined up. Honorary member, you have executives from party of this, Harvard University, university. You have all these people lined up because you're going to need these people if you get in on the commission. I'm a little excited. Let me take it some more. Oh, dang, my water done. My water done, y'all. My water done. Four members of the commission should constitute a quorum, but a lesser number may hold hearings. Chair and vice chair, the commission shall elect a chair and vice chair from among its members. The term of office of each shall be for the life of the commission. Okay, 
So there is a time restraint on all of this. Once you do all of this, you can't have a whole line of enemies because the reason is once you show up, you have to have all these things in place to show up before the president to begin to do what it is that you're going to do. I'm going to jump down. Compensation. Except as provided in paragraph two, each man of the commission shall receive compensation at the daily equivalent of the annual rate of basic pay payable for GS-18 on the general schedule. United States code for each day, including travel time during which he or she. So this is a job. They're going to go on special assignment. They're going on special assignment, y'all. This is all what the pitch for the HR 40 is. I read this bill, I believe, online years ago. Then it goes into administrative provisions, power of the commission, contracts. Look at this, contracts. The commission may procure supply services property by contract in accordance with applicable laws and regulations to the extent or in such amounts as provided in appropriate acts. So they're telling them yeah, like, how much I'm gonna give you, how much is gonna be allowed, this, that, and the third termination. So after you've collected all of the data that you're going to later present to Congress for them to consider what remedy is going to be given, it says the commission shall terminate 90 days after the date of which the commission submits its report. All of this is just to get a report. And here is what the big to do is authorization of appropriations to carry out the provisions of this act. There are authorized to be appropriated eight million dollars. Eight million dollars. This proposal to study, not to give anybody anything yet. This is they're sending out the insurance adjusters to see what damage has been incurred. This proposal to study has a price tag of eight million dollars. And if this thing is pushed through, you're going to need all the players in line so that, like they said, you have. 90 to 30, 90 days, and then you have 120 days. You have a time frame that once it says go, you have to show up, do the work, and put the report in. And they want $8 million. This is what's in the bill to do the work, to hire all the investigative people to, and, and take for the pay for their time to be able to do such an expansive work. It's a huge undertaking. Huge. Huge. I release my screen. <clears throat> 865 no they're shortening us 200 years can, i can go back further than that with my ancestors yeah due process well that's where that's what that's only what it's going to be studying it's only going to be studying this is the bill this is what you're talking about the reparations bill hr 40 they're only giving between 1619 and 1865 and from there, they're going to be in studying the impacts of these forces on living African-Americans to the recommendation to Congress for appropriate remedies and for other purposes. So they're going to be studying that time frame plus the effects. That's a massive undertaking. And they, they say, once I give you this in a short period of time, whatever the time for the commission, however long it takes, you need to have all of these players in line and they need to be of a certain caliber to be able to deliver this work. So like I said before, I'm not new to this conversation, but I, I look at it for different reasons. Um, reparations is about repair, not just getting the bag. I, I agree with that. And it, I agree with that on all sides. They're afraid that reparations will bankrupt the US. The US already not no money. <laughs> the US done already not no money. US done in our debt. Um, they're saying that because it will bankrupt the country, true reparations will be treat Europeans like bad tenant and lost them out of the country. This is what I'm saying. All of the implications for so many things, it's, it's not even just a single thing, I will say. I'll leave it at that. It's so complicated. It's so intertwined. There's so many things, emotional, physical, mental, spiritual, all of these aspects. We, we can just pick a spot. You know what I'm saying? There's so much that we can just pick a spot and begin to dig in. And I promise you, it'll take us forever and two days to meet in the middle. Because all of these things are just wrapped up together. There's so much that was done. There's so much that was left on record. And there's so much that we don't know. So I want to thank everybody for joining us in this conversation. I talked to my voice, that horse. I hope you appreciate it. The time, energy, and sprint. The, the, the compassion, the love, 
the desire for us to, you know, find that healing. You know what I mean? Work through it. It's not, it's not, I, I think in this Eliana Van Zandt fix my life type of uh, television, sometimes people be like, oh, I want to do my healing. It, 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 it's a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like, oh, you know, it's work. It's work. It's getting uncomfortable, feeling uncomfortable, pushing through, being honest, acknowledging. It's a whole lot of stuff. It's a whole lot of stuff. So with that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give a little rest for now. I'm going to give a little rest. I'm not going to come back. No, no, let me not say that. I'm bugging out. What am I saying? No, I'm just, I'm just give a little rest for now. <laughs> Good talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming through. Let me not say that. Next thing you know, I'll be popping up. Be like, yeah, I got more. All right, everybody. Y'all have a blessed night. And click the links in the box, y'all. Let me know if you get any of the books and let me know what else you find. All right? One.